sleep. Am I boring you? You ain't singing. You're just laying there. Maybe somebody else needs to get up here. Huh? Would you stand with me, please, as we sing 666? 666. Though we sometimes all hear elements heart with fear, freedom we all hold dear. Now is our stake. Mom, then your heart to save from the chastening. Seek the way pilgrims trot, Christians are awake. Yes, Jesus is coming morning or night. Many will be. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise and meet in the going where no one dies. Heaven was bound. There were so many losing their home mouth. This and God's word, He was abound. When all has come, Nearing the end, it become very fast. Trumpets will sound. This Jesus is coming, morning or night. Many will meet. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead, righteous meeting. Going where no one heaven was found. So it was will soon be happy forever. When we meet on free from all care, rising up in the telling the world home would we then. Glory to Sham, my Jesus is coming, morning and night, many with me, trumpets will sound, all of the dead, righteous meeting, going where no one, heaven would bow. Yes, Jesus is coming, morning and night, many will meet, trumpets will sound, all of the dead, righteous meeting, going where no one dies, heaven was bound. My Jesus is coming. Morning or night, many will meet, trumpets will sound, all of the dead, righteous meeting, going where no one dies, heaven was bound. Yes, Jesus is coming, morning or night. Many will meet, trumpets will sound, all of the dead, righteous meeting. Good morning. It seems as if there are those who just don't want to stop singing. And you know, I don't mind. We could, uh, in heaven, there won't be any preaching. But there will be singing. And so we might as well practice while we're down here <laughs> so we can get it right. Uh, and at least we'll have that spirit uh, when we meet the Lord and be in his presence sing songs of joy, sing songs of deliverance, hallelujah, praise his holy name. Welcome all of you to our service this morning. We are happy to see you in the house. I have a uh, 
uh, a long sermon. <laughs> and so I wrote down, I wrote down every word. And what I will do instead of uh, walking the floor, I'll just stand right here and read. Is that all right? I, I, I promise if I read, you'll listen, unless it hits you. And I, I look up every now and then, and if you drop your head, I'm talking about you. Matthew chapter 23. Uh, I, I, I want you to read the first 12 verses. Don't read them while I'm speaking. But uh, when you get a chance of Matthew chapter 23, and the first 12 verses is what I really uh, want you to concentrate on. But uh, if you don't mind, I will take out of that uh, group of scriptures one verse, and that's verse 5. Uh, and, and I don't want to read the whole verse, but, but I will. But uh, listen to what verse 5 says. Everything they do is done for men to see. I could stop right there. Uh, let, me, let me just stop right there. Everything they do. Is done for men to see. Another translation uses these words. All their works they do for to be seen of men. The snare of self-importance. The question this morning is what's, what is your motivation for Christian service. That's what I call just getting to the point. That's the point. And that's what just that's just what Jesus did in Jerusalem before a great multitude of followers who drew close to him uh, to hear him teach. And so in our scripture Today, Jesus is bluntly war warning the Jews of the snare of self-importance. The multitude came to listen to a new rabbi whose teachings were markedly different from the customary teaching of the Pharisees. Up until now, most of them had been driven by fear to obey God and his laws. They knew the law of Moses, but they were unsure how to fulfill the law. They had sought guidance from the Pharisees, who were nothing more than self-appointed priests. The Pharisees had long lost their way through the maze of religious interpretation. And what started out as a sincere desire to lead the people of God had now culminated in self-indulgence and self-importance. But before you condemn these Pharisees too harshly, let me ask again the question that I ask. What motivates you for Christian service? The Pharisees were a relatively small group of dedicated laymen committed to the most rigorous interpretation and keeping of the Mosaic and the oral law. They sat on Moses' divinely appointed seat, but only by divine permission. They were no more appointed than they were accurate in their command of the law. They the Pharisees bid you to observe. 
And that observe and do, but do not ye after all their works, for they say, and do not. Maybe it is a little bit clearer from the New English Bible. I was in Portland and I bought one and I read this scripture. And, and it stuck in my mind from the New English Bible. It says, therefore, do what they tell you. Pay attention to their words. But do not follow their practices. For they say one thing. Y'all want to finish it? And they do another. The Pharisees had lost their way. They had started out to honor God, but had been trapped by a religious system that was doomed to failure. And so the question is, how did this happen? How did the Pharisees end up ensnared by the trap of self-importance? The Jewish people knew the law of Moses, but they were unsure how to fulfill it. So they entrusted the interpretation of the law to religious leaders to whom they would go and they would ask for guidance. <clears throat> year after year, the Pharisees would be called upon to settle uh, disputes over the interpretation. For example, one commandment which showed how Israel honored God was to keep the Sabbath day holy. Now the question some of the people had was, how do we do that? How do we keep the, the Sabbath day holy? And the rabbi said, it meant you don't do any work on the Sabbath. Then someone had asked, <coughs> exactly what do you mean by work? You have to do some things. You've got to do some work. So what is legitimate? And so the rabbis put their heads together and they found that in the law, they were instructed <coughs> to place the Holy of Holies 2,000 cubits away from the nearest home. And so it was uh, legitimate for people to walk 2,000 cubits to worship. And therefore the rabbi says, on the Sabbath day, you must not walk more than 2,000 cubits. That's about 1,000 yards. That became known as a Sabbath day's journey. And, and that was as far as you could go. If you went 2001, <coughs> you broke the law. If you went less than that, you broke the law. If you did anything different because they were the interpreters of the law, remember, <coughs> the purpose of this discussion, and somebody gave me a throat lozenge and it kind of stuck. So y'all, y'all, y'all put up with me for a minute. Uh, and, and, and it's just like anything else, you got to practice. I think some people ought to come to church more often, practice. <laughs> remember, remember the purpose of this discussion was to answer the question of the people, how do we honor God? And the answer was to keep the Sabbath. But now they have this thing so well defined that you honor God by not walking more than a thousand yards on the Sabbath day. But then matters got worse. Some people said that a thousand yards it ain't that much, and we have a lot of things that we need to do. Is there anything that we can do about this? So the rabbi said, what we could do is decide that you don't measure from your front door, but we'll go to the edge of your property, and then we'll measure from there a, a thousand yards, and that would give you some, uh, uh, some more distance. And that was helpful. That was a good thing. And then people said, look, we're really in a bind here. Is there anything else you could do? And so the rabbi said, well, uh, before the Sabbath begins, you walk a thousand yards and place some of your property or some food by the way. 
And, and, and then you can consider that the end of your property. And then you can walk a Sabbath day's journey from there. Now all of this may sound <clears throat> ridiculous, but it's called religion. It's amazing. It's amazing how people can start out to honor God. And if they're earnest, they have a tendency to get more and more meticulous about it until they lose track completely of honoring God and become entrapped in a system. If I do this, if I do this, if I could do this, give me a little bit more leeway and I'll honor God. That's what happened to the Pharisees. And that's what happens when generation after generation keep the ways of their forefathers as mere traditions. People no longer remember why they do what they do. They just do it. We don't know. A lot of us don't even know why we're doing what we're doing. Even some of the songs that we're singing, we don't know why and where they came from. A lot of the songs that we're singing uh, uh, comes out of slavery. And, and, and many of us are worshiping out of our pain rather than out of thanksgiving to God. And this is what drew Jesus' criticism. Jesus came to remind the people and the leaders and the priests that it's not about being holy. It's about being God's people. And he being their God. Jesus wanted them to see that the reason for living was more important than upright living. Now let's go back to the Pharisees for a minute. Y'all got time? Amen. I heard you say, Amen. They had become so enamored with their self appointed position of authority and leadership that they had ended up being focused solely on the image in the eyes of the people. But why? Somewhere between serving God and, and helping man, they fell into the snare of the devil, that old snare of self-importance. Rather than preserve the ceremonies of the law, they added some ceremonies of their own invention, which were burdensome, and were oppressive, but had no reason or even expediency. They would bear, they would wear long strolls. Look at the next verse, verse 6. They, they, they would wear long strolls of, of phylacteries, phylacteries on which there were written certain portions of the law. And these parchments became an important appendage to the Pharisees' character. The parchments then became larger and larger, either that they may have more written on them or they may have seen more readily. They wore them. And they wore them on their left hand. They wore it on their heads. They posted them at the gates and doorways to their homes. Reminds me of a man some years ago who always carried a a huge Bible, much larger, much larger than this Bible, to church every Sunday. It took some time. It, 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 it weighed a lot. But every Sunday he, he took this large family Bible to church. And, and, and some people in the church thought it was a little heavy, so they gave him a little small Bible for his personal study. But every Sunday he carried that big Bible to the church. Uh, to worship every Sunday. And, and so word went out to the church. He must be politicking to become a deacon. He's showing off. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? And so the Pharisees manufactured new religious ceremonies to make it more difficult to, uh, for the people to obey and, and, and separating the perfect Pharisees from the people they served. It's a sad time in the life of God's people when the self-appointed leadership who had become destitute of the meaning of serving God had endeavored to supply their life with phylacteries and made up traditions. Thank goodness 
We don't have such practices in our churches today. Or do we? Jesus announced the greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus knew even more importantly that the true reason for love is that God is with us. Jesus came to call people to walk with God. To remind us that God is for us. And that God is present here and now. Jesus is willing to challenge the crazy extremes that led the Pharisees and others away from God into a religious effort and self-righteous appointments. Jesus came out, came to point out to them, and he came to point out to us the dangerous behaviors that come when when we forget the heart of the matter and we live out of fear rather than out of love. When our motivation for obedience is to avoid judgment rather than to receive grace. Y'all ought to get that one. Jesus knew that the Pharisees were no more perfect than their Jewish followers. He saw, he saw through their uh, self-imposed religious habits and he warned them. He said, you ain't practicing. This is my language now. You ain't practicing what you preach. Are you guilty of the same sin? And it's sad how often Christians do one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday. It's sad. No wonder. No wonder the world can't see Christ in us. Like the Pharisees, we talk the talk, but we fail to walk the walk. And our worship turns out to be nothing more than exercise traditions and lip service. When then we have the audacity to defend ourselves, well, ain't nobody perfect. Well, no one's perfect, but perfection is not our goal. The goal is to put into practice what we have been taught by Jesus Christ. It's a matter of developing a new habit of practicing what you profess. Do you ever notice how we want to carry, uh, we want others to carry burdens that we're not willing to lift ourselves? So Jesus taught us to pray every day. He read the scriptures and, and give, but we translate the, that as you should rather than I should. You give. You pray. Rather than I should pray. And that's what the Pharisees did. All their rules were developed for others to follow. And the Pharisees were ensnared by their own self-importance. You know, they loved to be called rabbi. They loved to be called master teacher. They love to be called deacon. They love to be called trustee. They love to be called president. Uh, forgive me for getting off what the Bible really said. But, 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 but you understand, they love to sit in places of importance in religious gatherings. The king's table, the scribe's house, the marketplace, the head table, and all of the celebrations. And Jesus condemned them for their piousness. You know what piousness means? I looked it up. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what piousness means. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our distinguished privilege to have with us today. You finish the sentence. Giving respect to the man or the woman who teaches uh, uh, the will of God is commendable. But for him that teaches to demand and to crave attention is not commendable. I am the best preacher. There's nobody better than me. Piousness. I'm the best teacher. There's nobody better than me. Piousness. I am the best giver in the church. Look at me. I dropped this. In. You know, when I was growing up, uh, if, it had not been, if it had not been for the gospel, the real gospel of Christ, 
probably would not be a preacher today because when, uh, when I went home after being uh, baptized and I went to this local church uh, in my hometown and I observed everybody. And this one man, and I said this over and over again, when the collection basket came around, you know, putting $20 in the collection basket was a lot of money. Uh, go back to the uh, 60s. You'll understand that was a lot of money. And, and, and this man, every Sunday, he put in $20. And I, I just looked up to him and I said, wow, this man gives. And, 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 and so one Sunday, I, I decided to sit on the same uh, side of the building that he sat on. And, and, and I observed him, and, and, and he was the one who helped count the money. And I watched and observed him when he went to the back and the door was open. He put in the 20. He showed everybody. He put it in, and then he went back in the back, got it, put it back in his pocket. Piousness. I want everybody to see how good I am, how great I am, how smart I am. But God knows. God understands. God is the one who is going to be the judge. God is the one who is going to make the final decision as to whether we are doing his will or the devil's will. How did the Pharisees fall? into the trap of self-importance. They strayed from practicing what they preached. They appeared one way before the crowd, appeared quite another in private. But before we start going, pointing the finger, let me say that the multitude of the Jews who took their direction from the Pharisees were no better. The Jews were guilty of giving tithes to their religious leaders rather than to struggle with their own obedience. They would ask, what must I do? To be pure and holy. If the Pharisees' rules turn out to be incorrect, they would say, I only did what the Pharisees told me to do. It's that don't blame me syndrome. I did what the preacher said. You know, Brother Curl told me to do this. The elders told me to do this. The deacons told me to do this. And so when we look up to our leaders and officers to the point that we open the door of religion to run amok, that's when we begin to see the devastation of, of self-adjustment and, and self-preservation and self-righteousness start to creep in. The only way to escape the dangers of bad religion, and it was a real radical idea. Jesus said that the way out of self-righteous religion is meekness. He knew that true greatness was in service and it was in humility. Not in a subservient or slavish way. Jesus knew that the way out of selfishness was through healthy selflessness. Getting quiet now. The heart of humility and true servanthood was self-forgetfulness. Humility was not worried about where you stand in the eyes of your peers, but trusting in someone who is greater than yourself. That's what faith is all about. He who truly wishes to honor God are called to follow Christ. We are told do nothing from selfish or vainglory, but in humility count others better than yourself. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Took upon himself the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man. Guess what he did? He humbled himself. And he became obedient, even to death. Even to death on the cross. And there's no finer definition of servanthood that could ever be written. Not by the Pharisees. Not by your preacher. Not anybody that you serve in the Christian army. The life that God honors. The life that God trusts. Is the life that loses itself in God. 
So I dare ask the third time, what motivates you for Christian service? Is your service a practice or is it a principle? Is it a duty or is it a delight? Is it a ritual or is it an enjoyment? Is it a is it a ceremony or is it an opportunity? Is it just an activity or is it a an act of love? Do you view it as a requirement or is it a privilege? Is it just a custom? Or is it in your lifestyle? Are you attracted by recognition or simply a chance to serve? Jesus is calling humble servants to stay the course. Jesus is saying, I back up and give you my seat. Jesus is saying, if I get hit on one thing, I turn the other. Jesus is saying, I'll accept. Jesus is saying, I'll forgive. Jesus is saying, I'll lift you up. Jesus is saying, my own sense of self-righteousness is going to take a second place to his. Jesus said, I give up my seat. Jesus said, I will even become wrong for you. Oh, that's hard. But Jesus said, I will give up my life for you. I'm going to close now, but I want you to know what I see. I see some good-looking people. Y'all look so nice. And you know, I notice, forgive me for doing this, but when, when, when there was a chance to ask for prayer, instead of me bowing my head, I looked around at y'all. Most of y'all had your head bowed. I said, that's so beautiful. And at the end of the prayer, most of you said, amen. I said, that's so beautiful. You look good. But when somebody's hungry, amen. When, 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 when somebody's in need of a ride. I watched this movie where all these dressed up people and, uh, uh, I, I've forgotten the movie, and I promised I wasn't going to move from here up there. But y'all got to forgive me. I, I, let me just give you the scene uh, where it was a horror movie. It was a, a fantasy movie. And uh, they went to this place, and I, I guess it was a bar, and, and all of a sudden uh, these good-looking people, they were wealthy people, and uh, they got into a conversation, and somebody disagreed with the other person. And then all of a sudden, the body opened up, and that devil came out. You saw, you saw that look on their face to where they were just gorgeous people. And then all of a sudden, they changed into a devil. Jesus is saying that unless you are sincere in what you're doing, the devil is going to come out at the slightest insult. Unless you are committed to the service of God, then somehow if I say something that rubs you the wrong way, and I get letters, I get phone calls, what did you mean by that? I have no clue what I meant, except it was good. Amen. Where are you? Are, are, are we riding this train of self-importance that I am somebody? Why don't we all just start all over? Everybody in here is a nobody who is saved by somebody who brought us from nowhere to somewhere and made us somebody by, by his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. Amen. And I don't have to show off. You don't have to show out. If you do, it's for the Lord. If you do, it's just for his glory. You know, I, I, can I, uh, Tyson did it, but I, I just want to point out this young man. He, he didn't even notice. But I was sitting beside this brother, and, uh, and I did that when I first started uh, with listening to Paul. That brother can sing. 
I got to I stopped singing. Yeah, you, Troy. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, jump, jumper can't sing, man. It, it, it's you. Uh, <laughs> uh, he can hum good, uh, but the, the but but the brother can sing, and I'm I'm supposed to be singing. I'm supposed to be singing, and Paul's up there leading the singing, and I hear this brother singing. I stop. God, I want to hear the brother sing. And you know what? He wasn't paying any attention to anybody. He was just singing. So sing loud, but don't sing to make me jump, to make me shout. Sing so God can get all the glory. That's what it's like. So, so, so the, sense, the sense of who you are is we are somebody in Christ Jesus. And he made us. He made us all over again. We were the devils. We were the bad people. We were the ugly people. We were people who didn't have any hope. Jesus came to this world, became like us without sin, and showed us the way. Opened it up so we can talk to God. Left us his church. And I'm a member of his church, and I call it the church of Christ. It belongs to him. And and every day... I have to subjugate myself, make myself a little bit more humble, be quiet sometimes. Uh, always got to tell you what I mean. I don't have to, uh, you know, put on a show as to where I am and where I'm going and what I do. I used to, I used to uh, go down to Skid Row a lot. There was a brother about ten years ago who came here, and he was a member of our church, and I found out. He lived on Skid Row. Then he disappeared. He disappeared. And couldn't find him. He couldn't find him. He couldn't find him. So I went looking for him. So I went down to Skid Row, and I'm just walking up and down the street looking for this brother. And then a couple of Sundays later, somebody said, Brother, what are you doing hanging out down there with them folk? I, I never was hurt so bad in my life that I was not supposed to be seen down there with them folk. A month or so after that, I, time is up, a month or so after that, I, uh, he, he walked back into the church house. I never found him, but he walked back into the church house. And I, and I said, Brother, where have you been? He says, I was on Skid Row. And uh, I guess I just missed him. And I said, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. He said, yes, there was a group of students from a college in Tennessee who decided to make a mission trip to come out and teach the gospel on Skid Row. And they came up to me and told me they were from the Church of Christ in Tennessee, and I told them that I was a member of the Church of Christ. It took some people from Tennessee to come and find them when I ain't got time because I'm scared of what y'all going to say when you see me. Uh, enough, enough. It's time for us to get our act together to make sure that we're serving the Lord the way we should be serving. So somehow, if you've fallen by the wayside, we get so caught up in my own, my own job. I get so caught up in my own self-importance. I get so caught up in my own money and the car that I drive to make sure that it's washed right and make sure I got through. All of that stuff, I get, I get so caught up in that that I ain't got time to say, hello, how are you doing? Somebody, stand on your feet, would you? Would you stand with me for a minute? Would you stand there for a minute? I want you to think about your relationship with God. Where are you? Where are you? Are you being the humble person that you need to be? Are we still proud? Are we still proud? Arrogant. And cared only for ourselves. So you come to the Lord this morning with an humble and broken spirit saying, heal me, make me right. And if you're not a Christian, you ought to become one. You come by hearing the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. He came because he loved us. And then you, you, when you hear the gospel, you believe it. Repent of your sins. Make the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Come to him. We'll bury you in water. Like we did last week, the three young men who came and put the water on in baptism. May God bless you. May God bless you. 
There are those of you who need to walk. Come, you walk right now while we sing the song. Living below in, in this right so now. sinful world. In this sinful Hardly world. Hardly a comfort Hardly. can afford. Strive.